It's time for the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. On this edition of the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast, we will be wrapping up another great year capped off by a great Super Bowl 54. We will take a look inside the XFL. We have MLB and NBA trade talks and so much more. We hope you stay tuned for another exciting episode. I'm glad you connected. This is Dave Johnson, voice of the Washington Wizards. You have connected to the right place because you are listening to my man, Josh Kirby, on Sports Podcast. All righty. Back with you, another episode of the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. We're part of the Mayo Please Podcast Network, brought to you by Route 11 Ships. Make sure you find a bag today inside your local Martin's Food Lion and Giant stores. We're also sponsored by PM Plus Reserves. Big thanks, as always, to MPT Now Productions, JR Beats Official, and Dave Johnson. We have a jam-packed show for you today and joining me as always on the phone from Blacksburg, Virginia, the one, the only Dan Dembski. What's going on, Dan? Nothing much, Josh. Just hanging in there, man. Appreciate you having me on again. It's always a pleasure to be on the best sports podcast I know. Oh, I really, really appreciate that, man. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, me and Dan shed our tears after the Super Bowl has ended because that is the last game in who knows how long before football starts back up in the NFL. I'm sad. You're sad, but we have a great Super Bowl to recap. So um, what were your thoughts on the Super Bowl as a whole, Dan? It was a fantastic game. I think it was Everything that I anticipated as far as the game was concerned, um, the commercials were a little less than uh, great, I will say. But the game, I think, made up for it, especially the nice run at the end there by uh, the Chiefs, which I know we'll touch on. But um, it was a good Super Bowl. It was a uh, it was a real crowd pleaser, I think, this year. And I mean, there were two teams that, you know, one hadn't been in in 25 years and the other one was. you know, 50 years. So we definitely had a different Super Bowl this year. It was great to have some different teams in there than the usual Patriots, Matt, than the usual team, to, you know, Patriots versus whoever. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's good. It's, it's good to see. And, and it, and it was an exciting game and it made up, it was uh God, I can't speak. Um, it was an exciting game through and through. And uh, it definitely, I, I think reach the hype and then some. Yeah, I I mean this was not your conventional Super Bowl like you said before. There were two different teams that showed a lot of promise through the regular season and the postseason. And it, in my opinion, it was more a tale of two halves. And um, yeah, yeah. Kansas City um, seven and three to make ten points in the first half and. Uh, 10 points even in the um first half which was a close game and then um the second half it was sort of like San Francisco looked like they're going to run away with it then Kansas City in the fourth quarter um outscored San Francisco 21 points to nothing to come back and win and the big thing for me is Kansas City has won another comeback game first against Houston next against Kansas City and now against San Francisco in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it w- oh, sorry. Yeah, it was a great, great showing by all the teams, um, both teams. I mean, um, San Francisco, I, I, I fully expect them to be back in a Super Bowl again soon. 
I, I, I really love their talent, and I, I just don't think this is a one and done. I think San Francisco will be back in years to come, along with Kansas City. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd say that uh, I'd agree with Kansas City. I think they have certainly more longevity um, in, in the, in my eyes, as a team who can win two. I think, I think two or three Super Bowls in a decade. I don't see them putting together a string. Look, I don't think anyone's going to put together a string like we saw with the Patriots. I, I don't think we're going to see 20 years of success out of, out of either of these two teams consecutively. Um, but certainly I think Kansas City sticks around. But you just don't know. I mean, you have injuries. You have players departing. Anything can happen, Josh, that we've seen. And, um, you know, I, I really don't want to say too early on that, that either of these teams are going to be around for a while. But it, it looks like they will be. So we'll see. Let's talk quarterbacks, Dan. Patrick Mahomes, 26 for 42, 286 yards, two touchdowns and two interceptions. Mm-hmm. Early in the game, Patrick Mahomes seemed uneasy, and the 49ers really um, caught on to that um, with three points in the first half and seven points in the second half. Um, and the first drive for Kansas City was – a real like only three plays seven yards in yeah. a minute five seconds time of possession like it was a really uneasy first half for Patrick Mahomes but as the game progressed he seemed to get more comfortable comfortable ran in for a touchdown actually and on the 49ers side of the football Jimmy Garoppolo 20 for 31 219 yards with one touchdown and two interceptions yeah, yeah, both guys were sloppy. Uh, I'll start. I'll start with Mahomes. Um, like like you said, the San Francisco defense did a fantastic job early on, of of just attacking him. They hit him a lot, Josh. He got pelted a lot in that first half, and that's that's what you have to do um, to really any quarterback if you can get after him early, hit him often, and and just get them uncomfortable. And that's exactly what they did with Patrick Mahomes, um, and. He, he just looked uncomfortable. He couldn't do much in the pocket. He tried to get outside the pocket. And, Josh, the biggest surprise to me was how inaccurate he was throughout much of that game, really for the first three quarters. Um, he was missing a lot of easy throws, and we just don't see that from Patrick Mahomes. Um, so, so that was certainly strange. Um, but, but like you said, and, and as we mentioned, I mean, they can score in a heartbeat. They're one of those offenses that can, that can score in two or three plays. And that's exactly what they did when they had when they needed a score, whether it was Patrick Mahomes or whether it was Damian Williams or whoever, you know, they came through. Um, I just um, I think on the other side for Jimmy Garoppolo, he really looked uncomfortable. And I think we kind of saw the kind of quarterback he is. I, I just in my mind, he's he's an average quarterback. He's nothing more than an average quarterback. I think he's a bit overrated. I think people put him a little higher on a pedestal because of his charming good looks. No, I, I don't think that has anything to do with it. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I think being Tom Brady's protege has, has given him a lot of, a lot more street credit than maybe he deserves. Um, and I think his performance showed that. And he really, throughout the playoffs, he hasn't really been particularly dominant. He hasn't been that, that star quarterback that I think we all expected to see. So I, I think he got exposed a little bit and, Give a lot of credit to Kansas City's defense. So a lot of people were talking about how uh, they haven't faced an offense like San Francisco. And what I thought would happen basically did happen. I mean, the team that I said was going to go out and win, whether it was at the beginning of the game, I expected Kansas City to come out later and, and play better, and they did. Um, and, of course, scored two touchdowns late. Well, I scored them 21 nothing in the fourth. And just do what they do. And that's when they need a stop on defense, they get it. And when they need Patrick Mahomes, Damian Williams, and they're just arsenal of weapons on offense to get stuff done, they got it done. Uh, Garoppolo just didn't impress me, Josh. And if you're going to win the Super Bowl, you got to play well for four quarters. And he didn't put it all together. And he really didn't have a great game in general. I mean, the one touchdown pass, I'd say, was was the only really good thing about it. Um, He just looked uncomfortable. Um, they got a lot of pressure on him and it forced him to throw before he was ready and on the move, which I don't think he's very good at any, excuse me, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, that, that's my assessment. I, I think Mahomes played well enough to win, 
Um, he he didn't have his best game, even if you count the fourth quarter when they started to put it together. Um, I don't know if he deserved MVP. I know we'll probably discuss that. I'll give you my thoughts on that. But that's that's what I would say. I'd say Patrick Mahomes did enough to win, um, didn't play his best football game, and Jimmy Garoppolo was was uh, was subpar for sure. Yeah, um, and a cool stat, the touchdown pass Jimmy Garoppolo threw was to um, fullback Kyle Juszczyk. A funny Former stat. Ravens. A mm-hmm. funny stat. Uh, the 39-yard t- – um, the – he had 39 yards in the game with the passing touch uh, t- touchdown. Excuse me. He is the first fullback to score a touchdown in the Super Bowl in 17 years. Yeah, I love that guy because he was a Raven for several years. I wish we would have kept him, but I mean, f- fullbacks just aren't utilized anymore in the NFL. But we may see that uh, trend sort of come back. Just just from that game alone, I think maybe Kyle Uzcheck could get some teams saying maybe we should utilize the fullback more and maybe they'll start to make a comeback. I kind of hope it does because that was an exciting play to watch. You just don't see that from a fullback. Um, And uh, man, I was cheering all the way that he was running to the end zone, even though I wanted the chiefs to win. Um, I love Kyle. I love Kyle's use check. And I love when something strange like that happens, you just have to root for it. Absolutely. I think Juszczyk is one of the better fullbacks in the league and they they should be utilized more, but they just haven't in these past couple of seasons in the NFL. Yeah, so I I totally agree, man. They just they've started to fade away. I I hope they come back. And um, you know, I I think if you if you use them correctly, you they they really can be a weapon. And and I think any team could really get a lot of use out of a fullback. Yeah, and um, backtracking a little bit, Dan, your assessment on Jimmy Garoppolo, um, uh. I could agree with you saying that he has sort of a higher street cred because of where he came from in the New England Patriots system. But uh, I I don't really have much of an opinion because of the fact that I have not watched a lot of Jimmy Garoppolo to um, sort of make a fair assessment on the season he has had in the regular season and but the playoffs and super bowl i i think he was average like you said you know um there's room for improvement which i i think the 49ers will make and and it's just going to be interesting to see how the 49ers retool and get ready for this next season yeah i mean i i think they can come back for sure um they they might just need a more an, I think they need another weapon or two Josh I just don't think they have enough around Garoppolo right now to make a run at it um I still think they're they're on the cusp and they're probably on, right on the edge but I mean you got to play four quarters and what what we saw from Kyle Shanahan's for, uh, 49ers was not quite to the same extent of the Falcons collapse of which he was the uh defensive coordinator um but it 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 wasn't good. It it wasn't good. I mean, they they had that game in the bag and they they gave it away. And I I think you got to credit the Chiefs more, um, but but the Forty ers just didn't didn't do enough to uh, do what they had to do. Yeah, and another thing I noticed with uh, San Francisco, they it seemed like they had a lot of um sort of like tricky plays up their sleeve with Debo Samuel, a lot of reverses, and it looked like he was about to throw one, but he didn't. But a lot of reverses to the wide receiver in that game. Do you think their um, play calling was um, interesting? Do you think it helped them or hurt them? I'm sorry, can you ask that question again? I I zoned out for a sec. Uh Uh-oh, Dan zoning out here. Yeah. Uh oh, that's a terrible co host. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, Debo Samuel, a lot of reverses, mm-hmm. um, and tricky plays, um, yeah. nonetheless. Uh, do you think their play calling helped them or hurt them going into this game? Um, well, they had they had that play early on that was a reverse that went pretty well, but you know you just can't you can't run that sort of offense the entire game. Um. Did they try to – I'm trying to think. I think they tried to run the Philly special too. 
if I'm not mistaken. I, I do not believe so. I did not see anything that looked close to the Philly special. Well, there was one, well, one of the teams tried to run what looked like the Philly special to me, and it, and but it but it failed badly. It it I can't remember whether whether it was the Chiefs or the 49ers. And even in any in any uh, in any event, I think um, I think their play calling was certainly questionable. Um, you know, they just they just didn't didn't have it going for them. And you know, maybe maybe it has to do with the fact that Debo Samuel has been such a uh, a fantastic target for them all season and really has been um, their go-to receiver. Maybe they felt like, you know, we have to get the ball into his hands to have, to have a chance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just think they counted on a little, a little too much. Yeah. But Deba Samuel on the ground, three carries for 53 yards for the 49ers. Um, Dan, yeah, yeah, that I'll... long reverse. Yeah. Oh yeah. So um I I want to get a sort of like the turning point in this game um for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um they had back to back interceptions um on two drives in the second half, and it looks like oh no, this is the momentum San Francisco needed. But then in the fourth quarter, as I said before, the Chiefs outscore the 49ers 21 to nothing. Yeah, and and like I said at the beginning, that's just what the Chiefs do, man. They they can score in a hurry, and you can't give them an opportunity. And and the Forty ers just like I said, it's they they gave that game up. But um, the Chiefs are such a fantastic offense, and it's I've I've never seen a team that can score that quickly. I think in my lifetime, Josh, uh, an offense that can just score in one or two minutes and make it look so easy, like it's normal. Um, but they certainly do that, and and the and the Forty Niners, uh, they weren't at their best when they needed to be. All they had to do was take care of the football, um, and 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 run the clock down, and and they just couldn't do anything right at that point. And you got to give credit to the Chiefs' defense too. They're not getting enough credit, Josh, uh, for how they played in, uh, in in the fourth quarter to help get them back into that game and and take the lead too. So, um, they yeah. they deserve a ton of credit. It was a team effort for Kansas City and. No doubt, they they deserve they deserve their uh, first their first Super Bowl in a long time. Uh, would you like my assessment on the Kansas City Chiefs defense? Sure, why not? Uh, two former Redskins with interceptions: Kendall Fuller and Bashad Breland. Yeah, because they're actually good because they're on a good team. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, it, you know, I always have to bring up the Redskins, and two former Redskins just ha- got a Super Bowl ring. And Dan, you're you're happy because Kendall Fuller played for Virginia Tech. Yep, he's a former Hokie, and um, actually, one of the guys down here, it, he he was a former Virginia Tech student. Called that, he said that the Kendall Fuller was going to have the game clinching interception about an hour or so before. It happened. So shout out to him, Bailey Angle. Uh, great call, Bailey, and um, nice job with that one. I, I I don't know of many people who can make that sort of pre- prediction, and then boom, it comes through, comes true. So um, yeah, that's um, that's that's exciting stuff. I know I know you have to keep it local, so you have to bring up the Redskins, former Redskins player, <laughs> um, and stay true, stay true to your base. So I I give you a uh, I give you a, a fair nod with that. Absolutely. But um, to, going back to uh, taking care of the football, Kansas City, they, they weren't taking care of the football either. There were uh, Patrick Mahomes had two fumbles and one fumble by Damian Williams, none recovered by the 49ers. But still, that was a, a moment in the game where I was like, oh, San Francisco can hop on this. So the all, all in all, I feel like San Francisco had a lot of opportunities to run away with this game, but Kansas City just had enough to stay in the game and end up coming back and winning. Yeah, and I I think that just has to do with adjustments. Um, You know, even in the third quarter, I mean, the Chiefs looked like they were done. Obviously, in the fourth quarter, um, it it seemed more more light more likely that they were done. but I mean, Patrick Mahomes did not play well in the third quarter. Um, 
he threw two interceptions in the third, and it was 20 to 10 at that point. And then at that point, all the 49ers have to do is just matriculate the ball down the field, as the great Hank Stram, the former Kansas City Chiefs coach, would have would uh, said one time, and just just get five, six, seven yards of play, and, and take their time getting down the field and run some burn some clock. But I think the play calling got him in trouble. But Kansas City's defense stepped up. Kansas City was just a better team. I mean, let's 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 call what it was. I mean, they were simply the better team. I think a lot of people picked them to win for that reason. That's why I picked them. And uh, you know, they they did what they had to do, and they, they took care of business the way they know how. So um, give them all the credit. And you know, the 49ers offense just you know the the picture got black for them, and it it uh, it's it's not a good sign. In my in in my honest opinion, yeah. N- nonetheless, two great teams, a lot of talent, and a- as you said earlier, there won't be a decade Super Bowl run by the uh, like the New England Patriots have. But, but I do uh, believe that both of these teams could make it back. Just stick around, yeah. I yeah, I agree. I definitely agree with that. I think uh, I think long term we could see them win a couple Super Bowls each, maybe. But you know, like I said, all of that's speculative. Speculative. You never know with injuries. Like I said, with guys leaving, um, it's just one of those things. Especially with football, it's very hard to predict and hard to guess. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's sort of our recap of Super Bowl Fifty Four. It was a fun one. A great way to cap off the NFL 100th season. What 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 a ride it has been. So Dan, uh, I know you might cry because the NFL is almost over, but your thoughts on the NFL season as a whole? It was a fun season. We saw a lot of new teams this year in the playoffs. Um, it's exciting for the future of the NFL. Um, you know, like I said, we didn't see the Steelers or the Patriots dominate and, you know, get, get to the big game like we've seen so many times before. We got to see some, like I said, some some new teams, especially younger teams um, and promising futures for a lot of these, a lot of these teams. So um, overall, I'd, I'd say it was a very successful season for, for the NFL. They, we got to see a lot of fun players like Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes. Um, they, you know, they lead sort of the young crowd along with Deshaun Watson. And, um, you know, I, I think the NFL has got a very bright future in those players. And hopefully for my sake, Lamar Jackson, uh, has a very bright future. I think he will. Um, but I think the season to sum it up in, in general, it was, I, I would say new and exciting. If I could use a couple words, you took the words right out of my mouth. Great mind. Think alike, my man. Yes, sir. So my opinion, there were a lot of, like you said, new teams, young players. And I think this is when it's all going to shift. Next year could be the year that we don't see the Patriots in the playoffs. I think that that dynasty might be over after their wild card exit last year. There could be different teams making their push for the top. There could be a new dynasty starting next year. You never know. But it was exciting. It was fun to watch the um, new players, the rookies compete. There are a lot of teams that still need work. But, yeah, you know, it was different. It wasn't the usual contenders in the playoffs. There was a mix of different teams, and I really liked that. And I think it was a great way um, – it was a great NFL 100th season, and I will surely miss it. Yeah, and how about the team that wins the Super Bowl gets their first Super Bowl win in 50 years? I mean, how how much cooler could that be on the one on the 100th anniversary of the NFL? Yeah, very that's cool crazy. story. And you know, some of these some of these stories just write themselves, and that's certainly one. And yeah, I, I am going to miss it. I uh, it's it's going to be a long six months without football, without the NFL, I should say. Yeah, um, but the Kansas City Chiefs are victorious. Andy Reid really deserves this. Andy yeah. Reid is... We didn't talk about that. Yeah, he really does. 
Yeah, he. Uh, I, I was going to mention it, but Andy Reid, after uh, he's been in so many situations to get to the Super Bowl, he did it with the Eagles. They lost to the Patriots, but uh, to make it back to the big game and win and win it all is huge for Andy Reid. I think he will be a first ballot Hall of Fame head coach, and uh, he, he's just a great coach, hands down. I know a lot of people are happy for him. I'm happy for him. He really deserved that win. He's a great head coach, and he has a Super Bowl ring to show for it now. Yeah, and he he was already a Hall of Famer. I don't, I don't know if he's if he was first ballot or not, um, but you know he certainly. I'm, I, I got to look up his. Uh, you know he's won 207 games all time and 128 losses. That gives him a 618 winning percentage. That's just unbelievable. <laughs> it's just baffling to me. Um, he pretty much. Let me see. They pretty much made the only missed the playoffs six times in his career. Wait, one, two. Yeah, you usually when he made the playoffs, it was usually a one and done scenario, if I'm correct. Um, well, not the first four years they were in it. They got to the divisional round, championship, 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 Super Bowl, and then the divisional round, championship. Then it then it got to be like wild card. Wild card, divisional round, divisional round, wild card. And of course, last year, lost to the Patriots in a game that they should have won. If it wasn't for D Ford, who is now on the 49ers. Oh my God. Such an idiotic play, man. (laughs) That was last year. Man, he could have ended the Patriots' uh, run at it uh, last year, but well deserved. Um, Like you said, Andy Reid, just, just a class act. Um, a guy who so many players talk great things about him and coaches talk great things about him. I mean, how often does that happen? You know, how often do people have nothing but great things to say about a coach? And that's not to say he's easy on his players or his co- or his fellow coaches, but he's because he's not. And uh, you know, his coaching tree is also exp- expansive and just and very very unique. So I'm happy for for Andy Reid. He really deserves it. I hope. You know, I, I wish him all the best. I hope he continues to have success. I don't know how much longer he'll coach, to be honest, Josh. Um, he's he's getting up there in age now. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next two to three years he hangs it up and lets someone else take the reins. Because he's been doing it a while, but he's he's had a, a, a lot of success doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely, indeed. Um, Dan, any last words to wrap up? the NFL season. I, like I mentioned, I mean, it was just a fun 100th season. I think it lived up to the hype. It lived up to the potential. And uh, you had kind of a historic franchise win the, um, I almost said the World Series, win the Super Bowl. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking about the World Series. Anyway. All right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's how I would say. I mean, it was, just, it was just a great 100th season. Exactly what the NFL wanted, I think. Um, two great teams in the Super Bowl, a great matchup. Um, some um, like 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 we mentioned, a lot of a lot of youth in the NFL, a lot of uh, um, oh my gosh, I just can't think of words today. Uh oh, Dan's at it again. Well, oh my gosh, anyway, <laughs> you you know what I mean. So we're just gonna yeah. leave it at that. It was a great 100 season. And I'm looking forward to season 101 next year. That It's going to be huge. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the 100th season of NFL coverage on the Josh Kirby on Sports podcast. I, I, I want to thank everybody, first and foremost, for their support and their contributions to the podcast. Jason Kamlowski for doing Fantasy Football Files. Dan as always, for always helping me out. Thank you, brother. And a- anybody else who has c- come on during football season to talk NFL, it- it's been a great one. If I've left your name out, you know who you are. I really, really appreciate you. Um, for those of you who are still on the football high, there's good news. The XFL starts this weekend. And uh, it, it's going to start off. Uh, here's the format. There are eight teams. 
It starts Saturday and Sunday with two games each. Saturday at 2 o'clock, the Seattle Sea Dragons play the D.C. Defenders. At 5 o'clock, the L.A. Wildcats face the Houston Roughnecks. Then on Sunday, the Tampa Bay Vipers face the New York Guardians. And the St. Louis Blackhawks, Battlehawks, excuse me, face the Dallas Renegades. Um, uh, What comes to mind when I hear about the XFL, how the first time it failed and Vince McMahon is starting it up once again. So there are eight teams in the XFL. Um, They play every week. There are two games on Saturday, two games on Sunday. Um, uh, I get a lot of the vibe of the AAF, how this could be another busted football league that could fold halfway through the season. But, you, you know, like I was with the AAF, I am looking forward to seeing what the XFL has. And, uh, Dan, I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, what are you expecting from the XFL? And th- do you think it could end up like the AAF? Well, yeah, there's some strange rules. I, I, I don't know them. Um, not strange, but different rules than regular football. Um, like I said, I don't know them off the top of my head. I've just heard rumbles, rumblings here and there, and I've seen things about it. I think this this will end up different than the AAF simply because I think seeing the failure of the AAF last year kind of gave, um, first of all, that was such a poorly designed and financed um, football league. I think the XFL is a little more financially stable uh, than, than the AAF was, and they have a little bit more – of a plan in place to how to pay for, pay the players and the coaches, because that's, you know, that they, the, the AAF just ran out of money. I mean, bar none. So yeah, they were asking for funding from the NFL, but yeah. the concept of the AAF um, former players in the NFL that come together and in like the, uh, are like commissioners, if you know what I mean, they started the AAF. And it was a lot more. You know, I I don't really know the word for this, and it really I, I'm just like you today, Dan. But it it was, oh my gosh, the AAF was more player oriented. I want to say, like by the players of the NFL for the players, and I I think it really gave people a shot to sort of bounce back. And you saw a lot of names that you haven't heard of in a while playing for the AF. But the problem was they weren't popular lo- enough. There wasn't enough viewership and it, they just ran out of money. But in my opinion, that would have been a very, very great league if they did not run out of money. If they were in business as of today, I still feel like it would it would be a great league. Yeah, um, I agree with that, but you know, it's it's not going to matter when you, when you don't manage your finances properly. Also, absolutely. Here's here's another thing that I, I think is not being considered when you compare the AAF and the XFL. They announced the XFL was going to come back like four years ago. Now, they've had four years to plan this out to get it, to get all the pieces in place. The XFL was only announced, or the the XFL, the AAF was only announced one year ahead of time. So, I mean, they had to kind of scramble to get everything. Um, it was founded on March 20th and they, they folded on April 17th, <laughs> um, founded on March 20th, 2018 folded on April 17th, 2019. So barely more than a year after their founding, they folded. Um, so uh, I just, I, I like what the XFL has done more. They, and like I said, they announced it, it, it Three or four years ago, I can't remember the exact exact thing. And they saw a perfect example of you know less than a year ago how not to run a football operation. So yeah, I, I, I I think this will go better. Um, we'll see after the first season. I think the first season is going to be a tell all because obviously for the original XFL, it was one season and then it was done. So um, 
we'll just have to see how the first season plays out, Josh. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I really don't know how it's going to, how it's going to all fall into place. I, I, I think Vince McMahon knows what worked last time and especially what didn't work. I think he learned from his mistakes. I, I think he's brought in the right people. I think Oliver Luck is a fantastic, was a fantastic hire. He's a great football guy. He knows a lot about the business and about the football side of things. So they seem to be pushing all the right buttons, but can they manage their finances correctly? That's really going to be what it comes down to at the end of the day. Yeah, so are you going to be tuned in? Are you going to be a hardcore football fan your Saturdays and Sundays taken up? or not? Uh, I don't know because one thing about the NFL season ending is that I can start to be productive on the weekends. Um, I am not productive on Saturdays and Sundays during football season. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll probably watch a couple games, but I'm not I'm not going to get too involved early on until I kind of see what what the landscape's going to be. Because um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, – obviously there's a lot of people who are like – who who aren't convinced that this is going to work, obviously because it failed, um, you know, 18 years ago now or 19 years ago. Um, so, I mean, that could easily happen again. So I – I don't know. I we'll see. We'll see what the um. I I'm kind of inter- interested to see what the viewership is for the first week. You know, will it, will it be will it be strong? Will it be weak? We'll see. I think people want to see football no matter what. Um. And the I mean the the AAF started off hot, but the, I mean they cooled off quickly. You know, people um. People started to turn and run. So we'll see what happens. I I like I said. I think the XFL is done a lot of learning they've done a lot of growing and they they can certainly get it right this time around but yeah you know, um, after that first season we're just going to see if they if they can hang around longer. yeah absolutely but i i think a big thing for viewership is that these games are going to be televised on fox abc and espn three national carriers that could yeah. do a lot for viewership the aaf they were only on CBS Sports, Bleacher Report Online, and I, I forget the third one. So they didn't there was NFL have... Network, Turner Sports, and CBS Sports, and oh. Bleacher and Report Bleacher. Online. Yeah, yeah. So they, I, I mean, I feel like TV could play a factor since oh, yeah. national carriers are covering yeah. this game. Yep. So it, it's really going to be very interesting to see viewership in everything. And I, I feel like I've had this conversation last year with the AAF. Mm-hmm. I think, I think we did. Yeah. It's exciting though. Um, like I said, I don't know if I'll be as um, in tune as some folks, but I'm certainly going to watch the uh, DC team, the local team. And um, they've, they've got some exciting players, including uh former great Cardale Cardale Jones. So that'll, that'll be exciting. Yeah. But um, I, I don't, I don't think I'll be fully invested, but I I'm curious to see how it will play out. Yeah. And I want to see the rules, uh, the rule differential and all that. I, that's, that's exciting for me too. So, um, you know, I, we'll see, we'll see how it, uh, how it all, how it all comes down. But, uh, it it looks to be a good setup for for Vince McMahon and the XFL. I think they got a good thing going here. All right, let's run down some familiar names that are in the XFL this year, starting with Tampa Bay's head coach, former Chicago Bear head coach Mark Tressman. You uh-huh. got Aaron. Right. You have Aaron Murray from Georgia, pl- quarterback for Tampa Bay. Former Redskins disaster at head coach Jim Zorn, coaching no. Seattle. Oh, Mark no. <laughs> you got to be kidding, man. Former Raiders punter Marquette King um, punting for St. Louis. You got former coach in the NFL Kevin Gilbride coaching for New York. Matt McGloin from Penn State quarterbacking in New York. As Dan said, Cardale Jones from Ohio State, quarterbacking in D.C. You have Bob Stoops coaching in Dallas. Landry wow. Jones, the quarterback from Oklahoma, coaching in Dallas. No, not coaching, quarterbacking. I was about to say, he's not that old. <laughs> but um, 
who do you think could make an impact um getting a new home in the XFL? Uh Cardale Jones. I, I, I think he's gonna be fantastic. Uh they're actually the favorites right now, according to this article I just clicked on. The favorites to win the XFL this year. So <laughs> I, I I'm excited to see what he can do because he really didn't get much of a chance in the NFL. Yeah, he um, rode the bench most of his NFL career. Yeah, he only had six passing completions in the NFL. And, oh my gosh! And he had he was six of eleven with one pick. So they didn't really give him much of an opportunity. But I don't really know if his style would have um, would have transitioned well to the NFL. I, I don't really think it did. So maybe this will show people that. And this is a nice thing about the XFL and about developing football leagues that these guys could get a second chance maybe as a backup somewhere, even in the NFL. So I, I'm more, I'm excited to watch him play more than anybody else. I think. Absolutely. So now let's talk about some of the different rules. And I, I want to get your thoughts when I read these off Dan on what you think um, okay. about this. So kickoffs starting with the kickoffs. Um, out of bounds kick or a kick that lands short of the 20 yard line, the team will be penalized and the ball will be spotted at the 45 yard line. I like that. I, I think it gives incentive and, and it makes sure that kickers are, are, are more valuable maybe. Um, and it's challenging. I kind of like that idea of it. Um, it's certainly weird. It's, it's kind of a weird rule, but, I think it adds adds something else to the game. To be yeah, honest. I, yeah, I agree with that. In in a low starting up league, I feel like it's perfect because it gives fans a twist to watch and how the momentum of a game can change if the kickoff goes out of bounds or not inside the twenty, um, short of the twenty yard line, and that's right. in bounds too. Short of the twenty yard line inbounds, it goes directly out to the forty five yard line. That's a huge advantage. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. <laughs> it's cool though. Like I said, it it adds another element to the game that you wouldn't think would be important. Um, but it also just makes it exciting for fans too. We don't just want to see the same old same old for football. Make it make it different a little bit. I think this might be a little too different if I'm being honest. Even though I said I liked it. Even though, you know, just because I like it doesn't mean that everyone else will. That's just kind of how life works. But yeah. we'll see. I mean, that's that that keeps keeps everything sort of at a at an odd balance. So we'll we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. So the next implementation of a different sort of rule, there's no kick attempt after a touchdown. Teams have the option to go for it. Um, a conversion at the two yard line, five yard line, or 10 yard line. And I, I'm not for certain, but I believe if you um, opt to go for the play at the two yard line and you convert, you get one point. At the five yard line, you get two points. In the 10 yard line, you get three points. Yeah, this is going to, this is going to get confusing early on. We're going to see a lot of people try to ask about what, what what the point after situation is. So that that's a little confusing, but um, like I said, we're just going to have to see all these in, in formation, I think. Yeah, absolutely. The next one is punts. If the punt goes out of bounds inside the 35-yard line or – no, yeah, excuse me. If the punt goes out of bounds inside the 35 yard line or gets kicked out of the back of the end zone, that's called a master touchback and the ball is placed at the 35 yard line. Major, major touchback, I think. That's what it says on the XFL website, at least. Yeah, major touchback. I, I got this from the XFL website. You can read all the rules on XFL.com. It's yeah, very it makes a little more sense on here. Well, it, they have videos and stuff too about they have YouTube videos too. So just, yeah, so yeah, go check that out. Yeah. Get, go check it out. Um, if you don't understand what we're saying, just go to XFL.com. They can explain it a lot better. Um, Dan, the double forward pass behind the line of scrimmage. That's, I like that. I like that a lot. I think that's interesting. 
Um, they can throw a second forward pass as long as the ball has at no time crossed the line of scrimmage. That's going to make it a little weird, though. That's that's that that's going to change it a little bit. So, um, you know, we'll see how people use. I want I want to see these rules in action. I want to see these rules on the field, though. That's that's really. I mean, we can't really talk much about them until we see them that way. So. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. I I agree with that. But yeah, you know, this is sort of like our predictions and what we think of the rules. So. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the last and final um, implementation I found interesting. If the game goes to overtime, you get five rounds, single play possessions. I I, re- I really like that. I I think the way the NFL does overtime right now is completely appalling and idiotic. Um, I think college is probably the closest thing right now to what makes sense. Um you go until the game's over. You go until you basically have a winner. Um, of course, Virginia Tech beat North Carolina in six overtimes this year. The game I, w- I was attending, and it was uh, I was very tired by the end of that. But I like this a lot. Um, you know, this is this is the way you want it. I mean, you want a winner. I I hate games that end in ties, and the NFL has uh, not not this past season, but or maybe it was two seasons ago now, but there were a lot of tied games and it was just, it was just overkill, man. It was, it was hard to, it was hard to get it. It was hard to get into it. I, see, I'm just struggling with words today. I don't know what it is. I, hey, I try to talk. You're a college kid. We understand. Thank you. I, I, what, what, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, overall, overall, I like that they're, there can't be a tie. I like that a team has to win, and you play till you win. So that's really what, to me, what sports should be all about. There should be no ties. Yeah, and I, I feel like in this overtime round, it's one and done. So you either have a good play in score or you don't. It all it all comes down to – yeah, exactly. It all comes down to scripting the right play for that situation. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and changing it up every time you get an opportunity. So – I, I love that too, Josh. I, I think that's very exciting. And it makes it – the coaches have to be more creative about it now. That you, you, can't just, you can't just get, you know, three or four chances down there and expect to have it, have it work out. So, Absolutely. So that was sort of our um, review, preview of the XFL. I'm really looking forward to this. Although I won't be fully invested, I will take time to watch at least some of the game and – I'm sure you will also, Dan. Yep, I will. All right, moving on to our next segment. Um, coming out of college football, um, Dan, a segment I want to hear your thoughts on um, regarding the transfer portal. Um, Justin Fuente, Virginia Tech's head coach, announced that players will not be able to return to the football team if they enter the transfer portal. Do you think the transfer portal has gotten out of hand? And what do you think of Justin Fuente's comments on this matter? I don't think, I think the transfer portal, poor, ah, see, here we go again. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's terrible. Um, I think the transfer portal is a good thing for college football. Um, Within reason. I mean, there's there's some exceptions. There's been a couple of players who've tried to transfer to Tech. One is Brock Hoffman. Um, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to go into the guys who um, – some of them have been snubbed from from that. But I, I, I think it's a good thing. I think players should be able to – if if they want to take their talents elsewhere and another team wants them, then, then give them an opportunity. Um, so – you, you know, I, I, I think overall it's, it's, it's going to turn out, it, it turns out to be a pretty good thing. Um, I, I'm not a fan of Justin Fuente. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think he has a very good um, relationship with his players. Um, he doesn't seem to um, enjoy he doesn't seem to be like a Frank Beamer sort of sort of situation where he um, kind of embraces his players and he's a player's coach and he loves his guys. He probably likes his players. He probably loves his players, but he's not the kind of guy to show it 
and he's not the kind of guy to go out of his way to have this emotional sort of connection with his players like Frank Beamer did or like current men's basketball coach Mike Young has with his players. Yeah, um, absolutely. I I feel like the um, attitude for Justin Fuente really changed after that big upset by ODU at ODU. And I, I, I mean, I feel like Justin Fuente just is not the same head coach Frank Beamer was. Frank Beamer was fun. He was a great coach. But I, I, I feel like Justin Fuente is more like strict, down to business, he's not mili- taking anybody's crap. He's, um, he's a general style coaching, which is basically like the military style. He's very old fashioned in that respect. And obviously, players aren't going to like that. I mean, they they want a coach like Frank Beamer, who's like a father figure, sort of. Um, you know, they want someone like that. I just I just don't see that with Justin Fuente, and I think this comment is very obtuse and it is it's just simply wrong. I mean, they've got they they got a couple players out of the portal last year. One of them being um, a, one of them being Hendon Hooker, who is now the starting quarterback. He was going to transfer, and they were able to get him back. But they've got some they've got some decent players um, in 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 the portal right now. So it's just uh, I just I just don't understand it. I I really don't understand it, Josh. Um, but I I just think the players overall don't don't respect him as a coach, and that's really what all this boils down to at the end of the day. And that that is why the transfer portal is in place. I mean, it's to get you out of a bad situation and get, get you in a good situation. Um, and I, I think Virginia tech's got a culture problem and I think it starts with Justin Fuente. Um, and they're, you know, they're going to be relatively, um, inexperienced in the coaching realm next year. Of course, they're going to have to replace Bud Foster, which the way he, the way he coached the last few games this season, I, I say it was time for him to retire. I think, um, it just wasn't working, but you know this is now officially Justin Fuente's team. I don't know if he got if he got away with everything that he was able to get away with when Bud Foster was there, but um, it's going to be interesting to see what the future holds. I, I think if Virginia Tech has a down season this year, I think he could be gone, and I, I kind of hope he is because um, he really hasn't lived up to the potential yet. He hasn't been able to recruit very well. And if you can't keep your own players, if the, your own players want to leave, then that that's a big issue to me. And I think that's that's a huge concern going forward. It, yeah, but I, I, I don't really want to talk much about the head coach, but more about the transfer portal. Uh, to add my two cents, I feel like the transfer portal makes college football in a way sort of like the NFL makes it like there is a free agency in college football, which could be beneficial if you're in a bad situation. But yet again, if players just want to play for a better team, but you know, you're not paying them, but you're not paying them. So this is, this is one thing the NCAA can do that's to say, well, we're not paying you, but look, you can kind of go wherever you want to go. And also it, you don't get to go wherever you want to go. You have to, you have to get approval and, just look up Brock Hoffman and, and, and let me know about that. He wanted to transfer to tech because his mom has a medical condition and they denied it. And they've, he's appealed a couple of times. He's waiting on another appeal. That's just one example of someone who, um, you know, tried to make it work and it, and it's not working. So um, it's, it's frustrating, but I, I, I think the transfer portal is a good thing. And uh, you know, quite honestly, I think these players should be compensated for their likeness. That's just me. We're not going to get into all that. I know. Um, but, <laughs> that's a whole nother podcast dan but like i said you're not paying them so uh, you know this is this is something that this is something that gives them the right to sort of go where they want to go and look if there's a fit there then then go where you want to go you know do do what you want to do live your dream don't let your dreams be dreams um just do it you know thanks shia labeouf for that little ending there i just gave it but I I think it's a good thing for college football. I I, I really do. Absolutely. Uh, I we appreciate your thoughts on that matter as well, Dan. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. When we return, we have news from MLB and the NBA regarding 
the trade uh, trade deadlines, and much more. You're listening to the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. The Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast, part of the Mayo Please Podcast Network, is sponsored by Route 11 Chips. Make sure you grab a bag today inside your local Martins, Food Lion, and Giant stores. And our new sponsor and fellow sports fans at PM Plus Reserves, providing reserve studies for homeowner and condominium associations in the Washington metropolitan area for the past 30 years. Make sure you check us out on all streaming platforms via the Mayo Please and the Josh Kirby on Sports podcast. You can also find the Josh Kirby on Sports podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, along with the Mayo Please on Twitter. Have any questions for the show? Feel free to shoot us an email at kirbyonsports at gmail.com. All right, we're back. Josh Kirby along with Dan Dembski calling in from Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, I hope you enjoyed that um, sort of football segment. Had the Super Bowl 54 recap, a look at the XFL, and Dan's thoughts on the transfer portal and Justin Fuentes' comments. Now we're moving on. Um, I want to talk about the blockbuster trade that just hit a couple days ago, Dan, w- between um, a few different teams. But the, the team I really want to look at is the Los Angeles Dodgers and how they managed to get a trade for Mookie Betts and David Price from the Boston Red Sox. Um, people are saying this could be a statement trade for the Los Angeles Dodgers um, in regards to making it deep into the playoffs and potentially winning a World Series. Um, in my opinion, I don't think so. I feel like the Dodgers, this is a great move for them. I feel like they'll make it to the playoffs. But still, you have a manager in Dave Roberts that has shown that he cannot win the big game. And you have a pitcher in Clayton Kershaw who it's like he rolls over and dies in playoff games, yeah, especially in the World Series. But last year, the World Series champion Nationals upset them uh, in extra innings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I know. I know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah. But um, the Dodgers gave up. Um, I mean, I, I really haven't heard of any of these names except for Kenta Maeda. In a, in a different trade, they gave up Jock Peterson to the Los Angeles Angels. So, Dan, um, with your baseball expertise, I know you're an Orioles fan, but what what do you oh, think of this move? Burn. Oh, <laughs> man. That's, that's rough. <laughs> I- I, I, I disagree with you. I, I think this gives them a great chance to, to contend um, and, and win a World Series. Um, David Price, not quite as appealing as maybe he once was. Um, you know, he's had his ups and downs in recent years. But Mookie Betts, I mean, that he's one of the hottest players in baseball right now. And here, here's their starting outfield. You got A.J. Pollock, Cody Bellinger, and Mookie Betts. That's just in the outfield alone. I mean, yeah, they're going to, that is, that is a solid have, outfield. They're not going to have any problems scoring runs. I think, like you said, it's going to come down to relief pitching. And um, I don't know what their situation is there, but they certainly won't have an issue um, defensively or, or, or scoring runs. They're not going to have any problems at all. I, th- I think this gives them a great chance to get back to the World Series. I'd, I don't know, you know, I, um, David Price certainly helps the pitching situation there too. Um, gives them another ace to to throw in their rotation. So for you to say it it it, it doesn't give them an opportunity, um, it gives them an opportunity to win the World Series, but just because of who their manager is, I I did I disagree with that. I think I think if you have good enough players, the manager just gets the hell out of the way and and says go do go do what you got to do and maybe make some small small changes here and there, but overall just let the players do what they do. I think if uh, Dave Roberts was smart, which I, I don't, I don't know his, uh, his IQ, um, he would just get out of the way and let, let these guys do what, do what they have to do. And the Dodgers will be successful. I I'm just going off of what I've seen in years past with different the Dodgers. Now. Yeah. I, 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 and I, I, I agree. And I think it definitely changes in the playoffs um, in, in the postseason for the Dodgers. They haven't, 
like you said, they haven't lived up to the expectation that, hey, this is a World Series contending team. Um, they've choked in multiple playoff series in the last four to five years. And Dave Roberts has been at the helm for those. But I, I, I don't know if that's his fault or I, I put it more on the players. Maybe he makes a couple managerial decisions that don't make sense. But like I said, leave the makes make decisions before the game and just see how everything plays out. And then, but don't do anything drastic if you're if if you're Dave Roberts. I mean, be smart with it and and see how it plays out. You have a World Series caliber team now, and if 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 you don't win with this team, you're not going to win with anybody. That's just the way I would put it. Yeah, I I mean, I'm not saying they're not going to be. Bad. I'm just saying this move is I never, great, yeah, I know. and I I feel like they're gonna get at least ninety to a hundred wins with you know, with Mookie Betts in the outfield, David Price, another ace to throw in their rotation. It's gonna be huge for the Dodgers, but I feel like um, the playoffs, the Dodgers are a completely different team, and uh, this is just based off past experience. I've noticed the Dodgers. I've seen how the Dodgers have played, and I'm very surprised after the Nationals upset the Dodgers that Dave Roberts, the Dodgers decided to keep Dave Roberts. But the, that that's my two cents on that. But it. It it was a really huge blockbuster trade in the MLB a couple days Absolutely. ago. Absolutely, but I mean that just goes to show you. I mean those most of the time those big time teams make those trades. Very seldom do you see a team like the Padres. I mean, we you do see a team like the Padres or the Orioles. The Orioles, no. I mean, the Orioles don't make any moves for anything because they don't want to spend money on anybody. Plus, they don't have the money. They are they're a small market, smaller market team. I guess a medium level market. Um, so, I mean, but that's, you know, mo- most of the time, the teams that get better, we're all, we're already world series caliber teams. So we'll see, we'll see what the season brings. I- I'm not excited for this season because, you know, you know, I'm an Orioles fan. So uh, the Orioles have a lot going for them in their farm league system. Uh, not really, but that, but that's okay. That's okay. At we're Rutschman, Dan. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we drafted him. We had the number one pick. We we took the best player, and yeah, he's he's good right now. But he's going to be playing. You know, he's probably going to be in the major leagues by the end of the season. But by 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 the looks of things, he's uh, from what I've been seeing, he's going to be a really great player. I he could be, <laughs> but you just don't know. Plus, this is the Orioles we're talking about. Very seldom do they get a guy in their minor league system who's a number one prospect like that, and they they do something good with it. Uh, Cal Rivkin was probably the last homegrown prospect that really turned out for him. Uh, Maybe, well, yeah, that's that's what I'd say. But I think he could be a great player. But uh, like I said, with with football, it's the same thing. I mean, it's a long season. There's injuries. Stuff happens, okay? And so they haven't played yet. (laughs) So we we haven't seen Mr. Adley uh, play yet. I know I I can't pronounce his last name, so I'm going to say his first name. <laughs> also, he went to Oregon State, which is my uh, third favorite college, actually. Fun fact. Yeah. So, um, a- actually, funny story. Yesterday, Dan, you want to hear a blast from the past? I do. I I really um, do. ESPN article from February fifth, twenty twenty, yesterday. The Rockies extend blank a non-roster invite to spring training. Can you guess who it is? Blank. Is it a former player? Former player. Is it Troy Tulowitzki? Nope. Is it... Just tell me already. Ubaldo Jimenez. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, why didn't... Oh, man. What a... I hate that guy. He's so terrible. <laughs> You so both that was terrible for the Orioles. I had to bring it up. Oh, he was so bad. And we spent so much money on him. Oh, man. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for that, Josh. Thanks for you. Baldo Jimenez is going to uh, haunt me in my sleep every night. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Moving on to the last and final topic, NBA free agency. The deadline is approaching. Some um, trades I want to go over with you. Um Big trade 
um, Memphis picked up Andre Iguodala, immediately gets traded to the Heat, along with Jay Crowder, both from the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors traded D'Angelo Russell. You have a three-team trade between the Clippers, the Knicks, and the Washington Wizards. The Clippers picked up Marcus Morris and Isaiah Thomas coming from the Washington Wizards, but news broke that Isaiah Thomas, once the trade goes through, will be waived. Um, the Washington <laughs> Wizards... Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I just thought that was funny. Yeah, no, I, I, I know. Don't, don't, don't laugh about that. But Wizards pick up Jerome Robinson and trade away Jordan McRae, one of their decent players. You know, the Wizards have had a struggling season. Um, Cleveland, they have? Yeah, very, very bad, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and Cleveland okay. picks up Andre Drummond from the Pistons. So a couple familiar names in the NBA, but... um. I wanted to talk about Isaiah Thomas and how I believe this probably will be the last season for Isaiah Thomas after leaving Boston. Um, he's just been declining and uh, he played a couple, um, couple, I, I, I want to say maybe half a season for the wizards, but I'm not sure if he played last season. That's how long I've been following the NBA for. Um, but Anyways, Isaiah Thomas, the legend that he was in Boston, I think uh, it's almost time for him to go. And um, being that um, the Clippers are going to waive him, I just feel like that that's bad. And you know how um, their legend, um, their former great players in the NBA who are still in the NBA who are just, oh, they're still playing, you know, and it just really sucks to see. But, um, that that's sort of my two cents to wrap up the show. Um, but a lot of familiar names that we've heard of before switching to different teams in the NBA. Um, so it happens a lot more in the NBA than in any other league. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with that. It, it, that's why I can't keep track anymore. Um, I haven't watched the NBA in four or five years, and. If you don't watch it for one year, you miss a lot of players who've either moved teams or there's a bunch of new faces. So that's my excuse for not having anything to add to that conversation. Hey, it's all good, brother. It's all good. So that about wraps up the podcast. Dan, once again, as always, I appreciate you calling in to the show. Um, I appreciate you, you, man. Thanks. Thanks for all you do. Do you have any last words for the podcast? Keep your Baldo Jimenez 500,000 miles away from me, please. That's all I have to say. <laughs> all right. That's Dan's last um, words for the podcast. So that wraps up an exciting NFL season. If you're still looking forward to football, I hope you enjoy the XFL. Had a blast today, Dan. I appreciate it as always. Uh, we'll be taking next week off, so no podcast next week. We will be on the following week. But as always, for Dan Dembski, I'm Josh Kirby. We're part of the Mayo Please Podcast Network, brought to you by Route 11 Chips. Make sure you find a bag today inside your local Martin's Food Line and Giant Stores. We're also sponsored by PM Plus Reserves. And big thanks, as always, to MPT Now Productions, JR Beats Official, and Dave Johnson. Until next time, we say so long and peace out. Thank you, as always, for all your support throughout the NFL season. We will continue to pump out new and exciting content for each and every one of us, uh, for you, each and every one of you. So until next time, so long and peace out.